welcome back. It's your family talk show on Plus TV Africa. Today, we navigate the terrain of mentorship and leadership, and you're just in time to meet our next guest. And indeed, our next guest is a leader. She is Dr. Adeola Deborah Ulu Bamiji, a Nigerian Canadian technologist, the first black person to obtain a PhD in biomedical engineering in 2017. She is founder of STEM Hub, chief consultant of DTech Centric, and is led by the passion for community building through volunteering and mentorship. There's so much, you know, to say about our guests, but we'll just stop right there. And so it's, it's nice to have you join us on the show this morning, Dr. Deborah Ulubamiji. Thank you for joining us. Good morning, Mar, and good morning, Sar. It's very good to be here. And I'm Nigerian, so that's, there's no way of calling you by your first name. I hope you know. <laughs> I thank you for knighting me, for calling me a Sar. <laughs> Okay. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. So you've done great so far. We, we hear your story. Um, we went digging, you know, deeper into your success story. And we found out that that's just 10 years. You did something that um, we find a couple of young girls doing even today to help shore up the financial base of the family. Would you like to talk to us about it quickly? Um, 10 years. Um, I'm not sure which one you want me to talk about. The Hawking aspect? At age 10. Oh, <laughs> yes. So I, when I was 10, okay, I grew up in Nigeria. I grew up precisely in uh, Mokola Ibadan, Oyo State. And um, at a very young age, um, my, my parents, uh, both of them, very kind, but uh, they had financial constraints. So the only way we could kind of uh, help ourselves when we have to go to school is to get into the business of orchids. So as a, at a very young age, since I was nine, I, I hawked Pepe on the streets of Mokola and environs, trying wow. to uh, make hands meet and trying to support my mother, uh, who was um, really passionate about education, but couldn't afford to send us to school. And uh, we had to support her. So since I was nine, I learned how to make money Mm. I learned how to keep money. Wow. I learned what a family means, that we have to be together. We have to support one another. And our parents won't have it all figured out. Hmm. And as young people, we can play our part. Wow. Yes, it was painful, but it was a learning experience that shaped my life. As I, I watched my mother wake up every day at 3 a.m., and at that point, I would watch her go to Shasha Market to go and uh, purchase our, our, our goods. You go and buy pepper. Mm. And usually she'd be back home at 5.30 a.m. And she would head to another market, Bodija Market, to buy uh, dry food items like um, rice and all of that. And with all of that, we still are able to get to school before 8 a.m. in the morning because my father yeah. took on the responsibility of, of making sure uh, we, we get ready for school and uh, get to school on time. So at a very young age, I, I, I understood what a family meant, that a real father doesn't just sit, fold their hands and expect the mother to do everything. Mm. And a real mother doesn't just stay at home and expect the father to be the only one working. Yeah. That uh, a family is built yeah. when two parties truly work together. And when the children, since they're young, start to take responsibility and understand that they are part of a unit and not just here to enjoy, and they have to contribute. Really, sorry to cut in, but I, I, I think that was a massive responsibility for a child your age. Mm, nice. You know, and now as you attained adulthood with the future so unsure, how did you seek, you know, the assurance that the future would be at this least right. at least better. Thank you for that question. So, um, as a little girl on the wall of our living room, there was a picture. There, two, there were two pictures of people that I looked up to whose stories shaped my lives. One of them is a professor of nuclear physics, my father's cousin. The other one was a professor of medicine. So he was a clinical professor. They both grew up in Nigeria. They grew, both grew up in Ijara on State, 
with parents similar to mine. Both parents didn't have education and they were poor. But my uncles trek three miles every day to go to school and do the same thing coming back home. Mm. And both of them ended up in the U.S. with scholarships and earned good degrees and became pioneers of technologies. Mm. So every day when I look at those pictures, mm. I had that assurance that it didn't matter how I started. If I am determined, I would go really far. And my dad would regale us with stories of their upbringing, how they had nothing, and how my uncles have been able to make lives for themselves. So one of them is the pioneers of atomic bomb. And I would read about him and fantasize. And I said, I want to study physics just like my uncle. I want to get a PhD in physics just like him. So since I was like nine years old, I said to my dad, I want to get a PhD in physics. And I meant that because I obtained a bachelor's of science in physics. And my PhD, despite it being biomedical engineering, my major was engineering physics. Wow. So a child cannot be what they cannot see. And uh, since we're talking about leadership and mentorship, yeah. what you can see is truly what you can become. If you can't see it, you can't be it. And if you can't she fight can't for it, it, of course you can't get it. And uh, I'm very, you know, all of those were happening and my uncle uh, was in the U.S. He actually didn't know I was looking up to him. He didn't know that there was a child who wanted to become a professor of physics. But I, I did everything I could to get to that. I, I got a bachelor's of science and I wanted to do something revolutionary in physics like my uncle. Mm. But uh, it was too late to make atomic bombs. So I pursued the route <laughs> of medical physics, which was quite new at that time. And uh, biomedical was very new to Nigeria. There was no school that was really doing that. So I said, oh, I was going to go abroad and I was just going to find scholarship or wherever I could study for free. So I, I left Nigeria in 2018 uh, to pursue that dream and um, went from uh, Nigeria to Finland, where I got my master's degree and from Finland to Canada, where I got my PhD. And uh, it happened that I made history, just like my uncle. That, that's surprising, but it happened uh, because uh, when a child wants to do something because they saw something, mm. they could really give their all if they have the right support and if they fight for it, they'll get it. Well, I, I, I'm so, I'm so, I don't know what word to use. It's not exactly excitement hearing your story. Um, pictures in your home, you know, happen to be responsible for where you are today, spurring you on to greater heights. Um, you are aware, so aware of your environment and the vision and all of that. Um, unfortunately, right now, that isn't happening a lot in our environment. Um, you may have vision, you may not be able to be so conscious of your environment to see a role model and say, I'd like to be like him, I'd like to be like her. Would you say that the environment where you found yourself also, also helped, you know, to push you further up. Um, talking about the Western world as against where we are at the moment, where the opportunities are not as huge as they are here. So I wouldn't be here if I didn't pass through Nigeria. I wouldn't be here if I did not pass through my parents. The people who put the, those pictures on the wall of our living room where are my parents? Sure. The people who talk to me about education every day, where are my parents? They didn't have education, but they knew the impact of education, so they aligned the right tools in place for their children. They put those pictures up there, they talk about everything about my uncle's journeys mm. to us. And I grew up in Mokola, Ibadan, and at that time, it was full of so many different things. On the, on the streets, on very close to our house was Sunnyville, where they have a brothel, where prostitutes go there and people were doing all this bad stuff. There were people smoking weed in my neighborhood. There were people who were following him, all the men in my neighborhood. I saw that every day, but I chose to see something different. I chose to look inwards and look at the pictures on the wall of our living room mm. and said, that's who I want to be. I don't want to be the person who sleeps with uh, a daddy's mate for money because that's not going to take me far. 
Yeah. That's a be the better example of seeing my uncle, how they got out of poverty, using the brain was what I chose. So every young person makes a choice based on who they want to be, and that cannot be blamed on anyone. Hmm. I, I, I want to say that I also want to be on the side of the young people a little bit because these days we actually don't look in our neighborhood anymore. We look online, we look mm -hmm. on the internet, we use social media as our own playground. And who we follow on social media could literally shape who we become. True. That follow button, that follow button on, on Instagram tells you what you consume. That is because these people put out information on a regular basis. Some of them put out information every five hours, every four hours. And if that information does not elevate, if, if it does not edify, mm. if it, it does not shape you the right ways, it shapes you the wrong way. So every young person must assess and wonder, what are you consuming? Who are you following? Who are you learning from? Because whether we want this information or not, they are getting ingrained into our system because they are readily available in our timelines and we're consuming them. Wow. So we people shape who we want to become by intentionality. Really? Wow, that's that that that, that is um, powerful. That is very powerful. powerful. Now, um, let's let's even get closer home okay. now. In the last uh, one year, yeah, effectively, one year, the world has turned three sixty degrees or even more. Life, living, livelihood, things have changed. You know, the the whole structure mm -hmm. of our daily lives you know, has been altered by the obvious. Now, in a situation that we find ourselves now, how do you think one would be able to get uh, a mentor, for instance? Positive. Okay, so on, on the case of mentorship, I want to share a bit there. I, I'm Nigerian. And we, we are, one of the things we Nigerians uh, have as part of our culture is what can I get from you mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. instead of what can I give to you? So when people are looking for a mentor, they go out there and speak because a lot of people come to me and say, come and be my mentor. Mm. I'm a busy person. I have my own life. I have stuff to do. And then you come to me, come and be my mentor for free after having a full schedule and a full life. Free. When yes. you are looking for a mentor, instead of asking what your mentor can do for you, how about you ask what you can do for them first? Because people go about looking for mentors. They don't want to pay anybody. They just want you to come and be mentoring them. If that mentor asks the same question, what is in it for them? Do you think they will mentor you? They won't if all you want to do is stick for them. Yeah. So I want to admonish young people, anyone, even because everybody needs a mentor, including older people. If yeah. you're looking for a mentor, go out there and, and do something different than everybody else. Instead of looking for what they can give, look for what you can give to them. Because let me tell you, a good mentor is busy as a need for help. If yeah. there is a skill you know that you can give back to your community, go do that. Hmm. If there is something you can do, maybe in terms of volunteering, go and volunteer. So one of the mentors that I have, uh, one of our touch points is how we both love communities how he was given back to the community, and I was given back to the community. And we decided to kind of start talking about other things beyond giving back to the communities. And that's how he became my mentor. What are you doing for your neighborhood? What are you doing for your community? Because okay. in the process of serving your community, in the process of doing that 5K run for cancer, the person who you guys are doing 5K run for, for cancer together could be the VP of a company, mm. could be a business owner or could mentor you. If there's a common interest there, the thing just proceed. It progresses from just running together, helping to put the community together into getting mentored by them. Awesome. I would I I prefer people who do that approach of giving back and getting mentors or people who are actually ready to pay for mentorship. Okay. You want to get something and you're serious about it, if there's a program, go pay for it. Because yeah. that could go from a paid program into a full-blown, life-changing opportunity as even becoming friends. Excellent. Don't always ask for what they can do for you. Okay, from, 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 from your... From, 
I, sorry, sorry, we had to cut in. I, from, from your last um, discussion, I, I picked a few things. Now, would you say that internship and apprenticeship is also on the same line or level with mentorship? Because we have some traditional ways of apprenticeship in, in this part of the world. Yes, it could be, right? It, 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 it could be a perfect way of getting that person as your mentor. Now, apprenticeship could help end just such that you get a lot from that person, and at the end of that program, you guys don't see eye to eye anymore because you could become competitors. Okay. But it could be work done in a way where you continue to respect and support one another. As people are getting older, the new people come with fresh ideas, they come with innovations, they come with things that can also support that person they are learning from as an apprentice. Okay. So as an apprentice in your workplace, what value do you have? Or are you just there to collect and collect and after it's done, you're going? Or is there something that you also have a value that that person can benefit from? So apprenticeship is definitely a form of mentorship. But when that hand comes to apprenticeship, it could hand where that person thinks we are now rivals, mm. but it could hand where mutual respect transcend and that person continue to be proud of you. Mm. And whenever you have a need for their experience, mm. they will continue to share it with you. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting mm. stuff. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I, I, want to, I want to be a little personal now. No, well personal, is that the word? Oh, well, yeah. Maybe selfish. <laughs> because you see, for some of us uh, who have progressed in age mm. and probably experience, we are so much inundated with requests from the younger ones. Just like you said. Who, yeah, just like you said, who, um, who are seeking mentorship or assistance, of, you know, one way or the other. Now, what, what kind of advice would you give to those of us who, I don't know of any school of mentorship, we just found ourselves having to yeah. answer, you know, the call mm. of uh, some of our children and uh, people around the community. need to pass on information. What kind of inf um, um, advice would you give to us? So um, if, you, if you're already, if, you have, if your cohort is packed, so I always say everybody needs to have that limit. You can't keep taking mentees if you don't have room for it because you're going to get drained yourself. You're going to get overwhelmed. So there has to be a limit as to this is the number I can handle at a time. And mentorship can't be forever in some cases because we have to continue to make room for others. So you can, I always say, if you, if you are really taking people on as mentors or as mentees, make it official. Make yeah. it official where people know I am this person's mentor or mentee and there is a term. I want to be there supporting you on a regular basis for the next four or five years. Mm. And after that, I'd like to open the door for other people because I have a, li I have a term limit how many people I can take uh, per program. Wow. The second one is encourage them to look at other opportunities because sometimes the mentors don't have to be a lot older than you the mentor could be in your age age group the mentor could be just a little older than you and sometimes the mentor doesn't have to be extremely su successful if you are trying to get promoted to level three mm -hmm. and you went and make somebody in level 15 your mentor the person in level 15 passed through level three maybe 15 years ago they no longer remember actually how to navigate level three to level four. Sometimes the mentor they need is a little lower than the mentor they are seeking. You can help them realize that by helping them. Where do you want to go? Once they say that, you can help them pipe it down and say, I may not be the right mentor for you. Okay. You may need to find somebody who has five years of experience because their experience is still fresh. It can guide you to get to where they are quicker because I passed through that 15 years ago. And because of digitization and a lot of transformation that we have had, my advice may not be as timely for you okay. as you think it could because I passed through that many years ago. I think it, it comes to case by case where you evaluate and accept the ones that you think these are the right ones and I have space, and the mm -hmm. ones that you think you're not the right person for them, okay. 
help them see the type of mentors they could they could go get. That's yeah. very and helpful. And when you don't have room, mm -hmm. just just make sure to let them know there's no room right now. No, that's absolutely helpful. Yes. And um, now I'm going to also go personal and be selfish. Um, you're doing so well. You're doing greatly out there in Canada and um, in the USA. I wonder what plans you have because you glow. You glowingly talk about your background in Ibadan and uh, what's the what's the village again? It, you know, the area of Ibadan and and I'm so excited by that. It, uh, it, yes. Jare, yeah. And I'm wondering, do you have any plans yeah. to physically come do replicate what you're doing out there? That's on the one side, and secondly, how at what point are you able to turn um, a mentor into a sponsor? Okay. Uh, in terms of coming home, so I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a digital expert, so I focus on digital transformation, 3D printing is my area of special, specialty. I believe solely, and I want to tell you, my current full-time job is a remote role. So mm. I'm located remotely, and my, my company's headquarters is in another state. Okay. I'm saying that because physical presence don't matter anymore. People can be in different places and make extremely huge impact on each other's lives. In the last three years, I have mentored over 200 people from Australia to Nigeria, to India, to, to, to Canada, to the US, so many different places. They come on my mentorship program, their lives get shaped, and then they're able to replicate that helping other people. I believe that I don't need to be physically present in sure. Nigeria okay. before I make impact on the continent. During uh, when COVID-19 lockdown started, STEM Up Foundation started a, a skill, uh, skill up masterclass. And we ran over 20 masterclasses helping people learn new technologies. Hmm. And it was remote. Every weekend, the class went from three hours to five hours, and we were bringing thoughtful leaders to teach different things for free. And people didn't have to be physically present in the US or Canada, and we didn't have to be physically present uh, in Africa. So I know that online mentorship, online learning is a thing. So we have to take advantage of that. And I think COVID-19 is forcing all of us to do that, accept digitization mm, as yeah. a tool to help us forge ahead. Yeah. Now, on the second question of, um, I don't remember. The How do you get your sponsor, your, your mentor, to probably to become, you know, sponsor. become a sponsor? Yeah. So, I have transformed a lot of my mentors to my sponsors by asking what I can do for them and making sure that I represent their interest. As people get to mentor you, you, you should ask questions too. You should try to get to know them. What are they passionate about? What do they want to do that they're a little confused about? Do you have those skills? So recently one person approached me on social media and said, doctor, you should build a website. So this guy wanted to join my mentorship program and uh, we, we started. And then he said, doctor, you should build a website. I'd like to build one for you. For you. Wow. Immediately he said that I sent him my phone number. I said, oh yeah, you tell to me or what's <laughs> Come by, help me. Okay. And since that moment, so I have a paid mentorship program. His mentorship program became free. Mm -hmm. Free. He no longer pays. He has access to me. He could text me anytime. He could ask Excellent. me things. Excellent. And he has my calendar. I could put a meeting in there anytime mm -hmm. he wants to talk about his career, his anything. And I would put my name on the line for this boy as wow. a mentor and as a wow. sponsor. Wow. Because he wow. gets to ask for my needs. Instead mm. of just asking what I could do for mm -hmm. him, yes. they're young people. Yes. Ask that mentor what you can do for them. It triggers them because they are overwhelmed. They're doing a lot of things and nobody cares about them. Nobody mm. cares about their well-being. Nobody cares about their needs. Find something they need. I had needed a website and I was, I was like, okay, I will pay for one. Somebody's helping me build one. Yeah, they just and there pick he it comes. up, whatever. <laughs> He's and doing it for he free. Comes, took over the project yeah. and said, I'm going to own it. I'm going to do it for free. I don't need to be paid. Mm. Do something for your mentor and watch them turn into sponsors. Okay. Well, you know what, uh, doctor? Uh, we really want to thank you for inspiring our viewers true, today true, true, with your story. True. Thank you. And for even flying the Nigerian flag so high. 
in Canada and the U.S. Well done. Well done. Thank you so much, Doctor. And um, Thank I was. You for I, I, me. I'm a fan of your work. And, um, and, you know, when I was told I was coming here, it was like I was doing a dance. <laughs> <laughs> what type of dance was it? <laughs> Any special kind of Atilogu Ati or Bata? Or what was it? <laughs> it's Maybe been a pleasure. Some sort of advanced batter. <laughs> Thank you. It's been a pleasure, and um, we're so proud of you. Please stay safe and keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma. Okay. Have a good day. Out there. Thank you. Well. Yeah. I don't know what to say. Awesome that conversation with our own doctor out there in America and Canada, doing us so proud. One of the world's brilliant actor and filmmaker. Once said, and I quote, show me a successful individual and I will show you someone who had real positive influences in his or her life. I do not care what you do for a living. If you do it well, I am sure there was someone cheering you on and showing you the way. And that someone is always a mentor, John. Yes. And do you know who that actor is? Denzel. Wow. Denzel, Denzel is one of Washington. my favorite. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, so much more to come later on on today with John and Helen, and I'm sure you are enjoying every moment of our conversation this morning. Please don't go away. We'll take a break, and we will be back with more.